สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today we're doing our retreat series, Harmony in Relationships. This is the second class of an eight-part series where I'm helping you to understand the teachings of the Buddha that will help you create harmony in your relationships. Today's class is about sharing the path to enlightenment, how to guide your children along this path. Because if you've spent any amount of time learning and practicing the teachings of the Buddha, then you should know that they're quite impactful for you and helping you to improve the condition of the mind and improving your relationships both personally and professionally. And one of the things that you might have come to is you might have decided that you would like to be able to share these teachings with your children or your grandchildren, your nieces, your nephews, perhaps other people around you. In this particular class, we're going to focus on sharing these teachings. Teachings with children, but they can also be the teachings that I share can also be used to share these teachings with others as well. I'm sure there's going to be things here that you're going to be able to gain in order to help you guide children along the path, but also this will help you in other relationships as well. So I'd like to welcome all of you to our class. If you have questions as we go, you're welcome to post those into Facebook, YouTube, or into Zoom. Or if you're in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions or follow-up questions that you like. So I'm just going to click over and share a few things here so that the audience in Zoom and on live stream can see what it is that I'm sharing, and help you guys kind of get an introduction to what I'm going to be sharing with you in regards to this topic. Essentially, what I'd like to start out sharing with you guys is that. It's really helpful to think about children as a growing plant, and you are the plant enthusiast interested in growing this plant. And think about the teachings of the Buddha as the guide state that's helping to guide this plant. And what you're doing is you're helping to guide this child along life, and you're using the teachings of the Buddha as the guide. And you're the one who's looking to grow this plant. And as you do, and you're starting to grow and share the teachings with your children, there's different ways to be able to do that, which I'm going to share with you today as part of today's class. And the first thing to understand in relationship to sharing teachings with any children is that it's highly important for you to acquire wisdom in your development of your life practice. Without you developing your understanding of these teachings, you wouldn't have the wisdom that you need in order to be able to share these teachings with others. So it's important that you. Spend time dedicated to learning and practicing, getting deep into understanding the teachings and actually practicing them on an ongoing basis. If you're just starting to learn the teachings, it might not be the best time for you to start sharing these with your children because you need to develop a certain amount of wisdom for yourself first. You can only share that which you understand and what you know. So by acquiring wisdom yourself through developing your own practice. This is going to better prepare you to then be able to share the teachings with your children. So that's essentially the first priority: is to develop your own wisdom. While you're actually choosing to perhaps move forward with sharing teachings with a child, it's important to keep in mind that a child is their own being. If you're a parent, you might think of this as my son or my daughter, as this is your child. Uh, it's important that you. Change that thinking and understand that these children don't belong to you. They're not yours. Because oftentimes, if we think of this as my child or my son or my daughter, we almost take this domineering approach where we think that our role or responsibility is to control this being to do things a certain way. But we're impermanent in their life. We aren't permanent, and our real goal, in terms of guiding our children, are to guide them to wisdom, helping them to become better and better decision makers. If we're trying to control their life and trying to force certain decisions onto them because we think they're my child, then they're not cultivating the wisdom that they need in order to make wise decisions in life. So. By changing the thinking and not thinking of them as my child and they belong to me, but thinking of them as their own independent being and guiding them in life, this can promote a better aspect of mind and a better way of looking at what your ultimate role is as a parent. 
it's really helpful to start early in your guidance with your children. You can start this while children are in the womb. We oftentimes don't think about a child in the womb as actually learning, but they are actually learning while they're inside the womb. That amount of skin that is kind of uh, over the baby and they're inside the womb, that isn't soundproof. They can actually hear the things that are going on in the world. They can hear the mom's voice. They can hear the dad's voice. They can hear friend's voice. They can hear coworkers' voice. They can hear music. They can hear TV. So if a individual is uh, pregnant with a child, you can actually be meditating. You can be uh, speaking with the five factors of well-spoken speech, being very calm, very peaceful, very joyful. And all of this is going to communicate be communicated to the baby inside the womb. If there's arguments going on while the child is inside the womb, if the mom's arguing with people or the dad's arguing with the mom or different people are involved in hostility or aggression, if the mom is overly frustrated and irritated and annoyed and all these kind of things, this is all going to affect the child growing inside the womb. So the more that the mom and the dad, if they're living together during pregnancy, the more that they're actually practicing these teachings, the better for the child because inside the womb, the baby can be learning calmness and composure and uh, they're not gonna be uh, bombarded with a bunch of frustration and hostility while they're in the womb. So think about the training of a child actually starting when it's in the womb, so that then when the mom is carrying the baby, you can be more attentive to your practice in terms of the way that you interact with others and that you interact with the baby. When my son, who isn't my son, but I just use that because it's easy for you guys to understand, when my son, Bailan, was inside his mother's womb, I used to talk to him and have discussions with him. I used to even play him music. I had a mandolin and I would play music for him while he was inside his mom's stomach. And when he came out, he recognized my voice right away. When uh, I said something uh, when we were in the delivery room, he looked and turned towards me. And when uh, later at home, when I would play the mandolin, he would uh, recognize that and it would actually help him fall asleep and kind of remind him of the time that he was inside the womb. And there were even times when he started walking and things like this, where he would go get the mandolin and bring it to me and put it in my lap. You know, he couldn't talk yet, but he was asking me to play it essentially. So children in uh, babies that are inside the stomach, they're learning the whole time. So if you think about it that way, then you'll understand to really be attentive to your practice. And even when they're, you know, one month old, three months old, six months old, oftentimes we think that because they can't talk and they can't communicate, that they're not necessarily learning, but they're absolutely learning during that time. So if you're cultivating this life of practicing these teachings for yourself in the home is practicing these teachings with the mom and the dad perhaps or even if it's a single mom who's pregnant at home and she's practicing these teachings when the child comes out and it's just an infant it's helpful to continue to practice the teachings even when the child's one month three months six months old and continuous because once again if the home is peaceful and joyful the child is absorbing this and if they're um, if there's arguing and yelling or hostility in the home, this is all being absorbed by the child, even uh, in that early part of its life. It, and it can't talk yet. It's still actually experiencing the learning through the interactions and the tone and the tempo of the voices that are being used. While the child is really young like this, if it has any difficulties with um, discontentedness because as a child grows you know it's going to cry it's going to be upset there's going to be things that startle it one of the ways to train a, a child that is even just three months old or six months old or uh, 12 months old you can actually be training a child to cut off and let go of discontentedness this early in life 
They're not going to be able to understand the Four Noble Truths. They're not going to be able to understand the Eightfold Path. They're not going to understand right mindfulness and awareness of mind. They're not going to understand right effort and to cut off and let go of discontentedness that is arising. But even at the age of six months or 12 months, a parent who understands these things, if they've deeply learned the path, they can actually help a child learn how to cut off and let go of their discontentedness. What you do is if you're playing with a child on the floor, for example, and say somebody drops something in the kitchen and it startles the child and they start crying and you can kind of see the look on their face that kind of precipitates or is kind of like uh, prior to becoming discontent. When you start seeing that discontentedness is arising in their mind, you can actually redirect their mind to help them cut off their discontentedness. So even early in life, when you see and observe that their discontentedness is arising, you can do things like, what is that? You know, you can guide them towards the window. Like, what is that? Was that a bird out there? And they're getting ready to cry. They're getting ready to get upset. They're getting ready to get frustrated or irritated or something like this. And you can observe it through their facial expressions, maybe through the color of their skin uh, and things like this. And you can redirect their mind to a toy, to something outside, to some other thing. Uh, you can show them a picture. Uh, different things like this and it'll teach them to cut off the discontentedness and you'll find that the child will actually get discontent less and less. We did this with Bailan when he was a child growing up and he didn't really cry much as a child and but when he did cry or when he did get discontent for any reason we were able to redirect his mind in these different ways and he learned to cut off his discontentedness and then as he aged it was easier and easier to be able to help him learn that because he was already doing it as an infant. So these are things that you can be doing very early in life when the child's in the womb and even when they come out to help them deal with their discontentedness and eliminate it. But then ultimately, of course, they're going to need additional learning as they age. So creating this culture of cultivating and acquiring wisdom in the home is very helpful where the children are incentivized to cultivate wisdom about the path to enlightenment yes but about all things not just the path to enlightenment but reading and learning and understanding you know watching things on tv that are educational looking things up on the internet reading books and things like this looking to help the children to figure out how to independently determine the truth where they're not just believing things. So even if they're watching TV or they're seeing things in school or they're reading books, even if it's fiction and things like this, you know, asking them questions once in a while about whether or not what they're learning is actually true or if it's real or if they're able to independently verify it, uh, motivating them to uh, understand that cultivating wisdom is what is needed as part of this life. Because if you understand the three poisons and what's keeping the mind in the unenlightened state and what's making it really a real struggle and difficult in life for people to uh, make decisions and to experience wholesome results, it's craving anger and ignorance or the unknowing of true reality. And in order to get to an improved state of mind and an improved life, an individual needs to transform that craving, anger, and ignorance into generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom. So by you cultivating a culture in your home of cultivating wisdom, and this is something that is really prioritized in the home, then the children get used to looking to cultivate wisdom. And of course, there's going to be fun, there's going to be games, there's going to be lots of uh, enjoyment in home. But as you cultivate wisdom and make that part of the culture, then the children can adopt that type of thinking. And then as they go forward in life, they start to value and appreciate and admire the ability to be able to cultivate wisdom and see how they can do that. <clears throat> Other things to think about and remember as you're guiding children along the path is that you're a role model. Whatever you're doing and however you interact with your children and other people in the world, your children are observing your practice and how you interact and they're learning from that. They're going to learn from your words and what you say, but 
through your own moral conduct, your mental discipline and your wisdom that you practice, children are going to be learning from you. They're going to be learning from the decisions that you make and how you interact in the world with other beings. They're going to model that conduct in your decision making. So where you're getting ready to make a decision and you feel like it's not read, you're not ready to make that decision, you can talk out loud and kind of walk your children through some of the decision making that you're doing and show them that you're taking their, your time and making decisions. So for example, if you notice that your children are making really quick, rapid decisions and they're not thinking them through, but you've kind of learned that you know you need to take your time and think through decisions and make wise decisions oftentimes requires some time to think about what it is that you're going to make a decision about. If you're getting ready to make a decision, maybe it's something simple as like getting tires on your car. And even though it's really easy for you to just go to the store, get new tires on your car, and that's what you would like to do, you can kind of look at the car, your children are there like, hey, you know, it looks like we need some new tires on this car the tires are, are getting kind of old. You know, I need to think about this. It, it's probably a wise decision to have some new tires on this car. You know, what do you think? You know, you might even ask your children, you know, what do you think? What about these tires? You know, and you can walk them through and show them how you're thinking about certain decisions and say, you know, I'm going to think about this for a day or two, look at the finances and see if this is a wise decision for me to go and purchase tires. Even if you've already made the decision that that's what you're going to do, you can use that as an example to show your children how you process the world around you and that you're not just making really quick, rapid decisions, but instead you're taking your time to think these things through. So as you're practicing the teachings, your children are going to practice whatever you practice. So if we're kind and polite and respectful to our children that's the way that they're going to be with us and as we're respectful towards our life partner our parents our grandparents our siblings our elders the people in the community children are learning and modeling their conduct after how we treat other people so the way that we talk about our parents the way that we treat our parents our children are learning how to treat us through the way that we treat our parents, for example. So if we are talking in negative ways about our parents, then our children are learning this is how we interact with our parents, so this is the way they're gonna interact with us. So if we interact and we discuss our parents in positive ways and we think in positive ways towards our parents, even though we might not agree with everything they do, there's no need for us to disparage our parents or talk negatively or do negative things uh, towards our parents because our children are then learning that from us. And then our gamma is going to be because we treated our parents in unwholesome ways and unwise ways, our children are going to treat us that way. That's the results of our decisions. That's what's coming back to us. So keeping in mind that being respectful to all people around us, being polite, kind, friendly, and respectful, our children are learning this through our interactions in the world. It's helpful to get comfortable with the struggle and allowing this to occur. Children are going to struggle, just like you struggled in life, just like other people struggle in life, your children are going to struggle as well. But oftentimes when there's attachment to a child, when a parent sees that their child is struggling, they might want to jump in right away, make a bunch of decisions and solve that problem so that the child doesn't struggle. But this actually ensures that the struggle continues and it makes the struggle worse. Any kind of struggle that an individual is experiencing, the reason why they're struggling is because they lack wisdom in how to make certain decisions. And if we just jump in when our children are struggling and make a whole lot of decisions for them, then they don't get the opportunity to make the uh, or develop the wisdom to be able to make wise decisions. So by jumping in and making a bunch of decisions for the child because we're uncomfortable with seeing the child struggle, this just inhibits them from being able to cultivate the wisdom that they need so that in the future 
that they don't experience that struggle. So if we jump in and make decisions and the child isn't able to cultivate wisdom, that just ensures that the struggle is going to happen again for that child. So it's important for a parent to step back and get comfortable with a child is sometimes going to struggle and allow that to occur. And then you're there as a parallel process in order to provide guidance and wisdom that they then cultivate to make wise decisions. Of course, if they're getting ready to cross the street and they're going to get hit by a car or a bus or something, we're going to you know, make sure that that doesn't happen. That's not the kind of struggle that we're talking about. But if a child is struggling with relationships or they're struggling with a certain task at home or they're challenged in one way or another, rather than feeling like your role is to ensure that they never struggle and jump in and make a bunch of decisions uh, to ensure they don't struggle, instead, provide them guidance and provide them wisdom that then allows them to make wise decisions. If they're having a challenge with a relationship at school with a uh, uh, with another student or even with the teacher, sometimes a parent would like to jump in and you know have conversations with the teacher and resolve this for their child. But again, if you're able to, if it's not such a significant uh, issue, you can then provide guidance and wisdom to the child and then allow them to go to school and try to use that wisdom to then resolve whatever challenge that they're experiencing. This will help them to then be able to cultivate the wisdom and then in the future they'll be able to use that wisdom so that they don't incur that same struggle. But by us just jumping in it's just going to ensure that that struggle it actually continues. It's going to happen more than one time. It's going to happen multiple times because the only time that uh, they're, or that, I'm sorry, that as they're actually struggling, if we jump in and solve that for them, then they're not able to cultivate the wisdom. So we need to understand that we're impermanent in their life. And because we're impermanent, the best thing that we can do is help to cultivate wisdom for the child and create an environment where they can do that and understand that we're in this parallel process where we're helping this being to become a wiser and wiser decision making decision maker and our role is to provide guidance so that they can cultivate the wisdom to do that it's really helpful for you to help the child to eliminate their attachment to their parents. Children are going to be attached to their parents and parents are going to be attached to their children most likely. As long as there's attachment in the relationship, there's going to be discontentedness. If the child is attached to the parent, they're going to be discontent at different times based on certain things that you do or certain things you don't do. If you're attached to the child, you're going to really struggle with stepping back and allowing them to struggle. So learning how to eliminate your attachment to your child and allowing uh, your child to learn how to eliminate their attachment to you, which is actually the next class that I'm going to be teaching next week, is learning how to eliminate attachments to those people who are closest to us. If you allow attachment to persist in a relationship, it's only going to lead to discontentedness. So it's possible to have a relationship with an individual while not being attached to them. The relationship itself isn't the attachment. It's the mental longing and strong eagerness, the wanting things to be a certain way. And one of the things you can do here, which I'll talk about next week as well, but specifically with children, is learn how to let go and allow the child to stay at other people's home for a period of time, whether it's two days or three days or four days, whether it's their grandparents, whether it's friends or other family members, and don't feel a need to call regularly and find out what's going on with the child. Learn how to allow the child to go to grandparents' house or an aunt or an uncle or some other place that you feel that they can be safe and then let go. If they're gone for a weekend and you're calling every day or two or three times a day to check in on them, that's your attachment. And their mind is going to be attached too. You would like to allow them the space and the freedom to be able to 
interact in the world without your involvement. And this is going to help them to eliminate their attachment. And there's other ways for you to do that too. Like when they're playing at home, even as an infant, having them play in one room and you be in another room and help them to learn how to play by themselves. Or um, as they're growing up, having them read a book in one room while you're in another room learning to sleep in a different room and having them sleep in a different room and being comfortable to fall asleep on their own more and more readily. These are all things and others that you can do to help a child eliminate any attachment because as long as there's attachment, there's going to be discontentedness in your relationship. You can actually get to a point where you never argue with your children, your children never argue with you, the children are respectful, they're polite, they're kind, they're friendly, and there's not this hostility or aggression or individuals trying to control each other in their relationship. But instead, you can get to this harmony where all the individuals in the family are functioning in harmony. But this is needed that you develop the ability for your children to learn what an attachment is and how to eliminate their attachment to you. And you might need to create environments and situations and conditions which allow them the ability to practice in such a way that they're able to eliminate their attachment. It's very helpful to cultivate patience. You're going to need a lot of patience with children and particularly with sharing these teachings. And as they learn these teachings more and more, the home will become more and more harmonious. So get comfortable with repeating the teachings multiple times and discussing them in different ways. It's just like what you experienced. There's going to be gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress. The child isn't going to be able to learn these teachings right away. So if there's any expectation that you should be able to explain something to your child once and they're going to get it right away on the first time, you're going to need to eliminate that and realize that it's going to take patience for you to explain something like impermanence, for example, and then repeat that over and over and even provide games and activities that help them to learn these different teachings. So when you're ready to teach your child, maybe by the age of six or something like this, this is at the time where I started more actively training Bailan, I started talking to him about impermanence and helping him to understand impermanence. And then we created this little game and this little activity. So he's not going to sit down in a discourse for you know an hour or two and listen to the three universal truths, the four noble truths, the eightfold path and things like this. But I can explain impermanence to a six year old child in you know, maybe a minute or two. And then we make a little game where we go outside and we, on, we go on the scavenger hunt to find impermanence. Once they understand that things are constantly changing, because at the age of six, they should have lost some teeth by that time. They have observed their bodies changing. You can walk them through this and help them see that aspect. But then by going outside and they're walking along the sidewalk and they see a crack and it's like, oh, daddy, look, this is impermanence right here. Yelp, you're a hundred percent right. High five. You found something. And then, you know, it's sunny out and then a cloud moves in front of the sun. Ah, that's impermanence. They found that. And then, you know, there's the green leaves in the trees and then there's brown leaves on the ground and they can find that or you can point it out to them and help them see it. And there's all these different things in the world around them that they can look at and they can have this scavenger hunt, for example, to cultivate the understanding of the universal truth of impermanence. When you're teaching something like concentration and singleness of mind, there's this game that some people play called concentration, where you take playing cards that you would normally play games with, like a king and queen and jack and 10 and nine, and all these different uh, types of cards, and you can flip them over. And then you flip one over and it's a king, and then they flip another one over and it's a 10. And then they have to remember where these are so that as you guys are playing this game together, that then it helps them to cultivate concentration. So by playing games with children that cultivate 
things like mindfulness and concentration and understanding these teachings. This is what is going to help them to actively learn these teachings because a six-year-old child isn't going to be able to pick up this book. They're not going to necessarily be able to read it and understand it. They're not going to be able to watch YouTube videos and podcasts. By the time they get to 12 or 13 or 14, they can surely be doing those things. But early in life, you'd like them to be able to understand these as early as possible. And because the earlier you start with them, their pollution of mind isn't going to be very significant. A child has very little ego typically. They have very little uh, anger in the mind and very little ill will and things like this. So when you start very early with them in life, as I mentioned earlier, then you're able to help them transform the mind before it gets really conditioned. That by the time they're you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and so on, the mind has been conditioned by the world around it so much that these three poisons and the 10 fetters are more deeply rooted in the mind. So by you starting early and making it fun and creative and having games, then they can transform their mind more readily while they're young and there's not as much pollution to deal with. It's important to understand not to force your child, that instead you would like to welcome them and invite them to learn, including meditation. You're not interested in forcing them to do any one particular thing or another, but as they're interested, then you can share these teachings with them. And starting small and then building from there. When I first started sharing these teachings with uh, Bailan, I realized that I was going to need to share with him an entire path to enlightenment. It was going to take many years of learning before he would ultimately end up understanding all the teachings and be able to practice them. And I happened to be sitting on the sofa and he was down on the floor and we were watching TV together. And the thoughts were going through my mind, like, how am I ever going to teach this child all of these teachings that I need to teach him that are really well suited for adults and they're not typically always taught to children. And I realized that I hadn't really actively taught him anything up until that point in his life at the age of six. And I was thinking, well, if this person, this being, this child is going to learn from me, they're going to need to be able to listen and receive guidance and kind of do things as I talk about them. And as I teach him, he's going to need to kind of follow what it is that I guide him to do. So I decided to start really small and he had the remote control next to him on the floor. And I just said to him, I said, Bailan, can you hand me the remote control? Because I hadn't even done that up until age six. I hadn't even asked him something as simple as that. And he said, sure, dad, here's the remote control. And he handed it to me. And I was like, oh, okay. So he was willing to do that. So then about 15 or 20 minutes later, I said, Bailan, can you go into the kitchen and get dad a glass of water? And he's like, sure, I'll do that for you, dad. And he gets up, he goes, he gets the glass, he gets a glass of water and he brings me a glass of water. And I was like, all right, well, he's following what I'm doing. So I started really small and just doing little small tasks like this. And then I built from there little by little to help him to grow in that he was willing to listen to me. And I confirmed that through these small little tasks. And he saw that when he did listen to me, dad was appreciative. And I, you know, maybe gave him a hug or I rubbed him on top of the head or I gave him a high five or I said, thank you. I appreciate your kindness and bringing me a glass of water. So I asked him to do something. He was willing to do it. And then it was reinforced with some type of praise or some type of thank you. And this was something that he was then willing to repeat. So let me pause here for a bit and see if you guys have any questions on anything that I've shared so far. There's plenty more for me to share with you guys in this class, but I would just like to pause here and see what questions you guys might have about what I've shared so far. You can put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions that you like. Yes, thank you, Teacher David. It looks like Chris Bryce has his hand up. Hi, Teacher David. I was wondering, what is a good age to start teaching children non-attachment toward their parents? Uh, because I'm, I'm kind of suspecting that um, you should wait until at least a particular age. 
So there's the active teaching of helping them understand what craving, desire, attachment is and you know, actively helping them to understand that. But you can actually be teaching a child you know, when they're an infant and when they're even one or two years old by doing some of the things that I described where they're in one room playing and you're in another room doing something else. This is helping them to learn that you're not always going to be there. Uh, of course, the room would need to be safe and you would have, you know, kind of your ear out and maybe you would peek in every once in a while to see that they're safe. But teaching them to be content and peaceful on their own, this is actually teaching non-attachment. You're not actively teaching it. <clears throat> you're not explaining it to them, but you're creating a situation where they understand you're not always going to be there because that's what the unenlightened mind wants is it's craving permanence and it wants mom and dad to be there permanently. So you can actually teach a child through just creating an environment where you're not always around, that they're in one room and you're in another room. But in terms of actively teaching a child, I chose to do that at age six with Bailan. I felt like that was a good age for him. And I also knew that during the lifetime of the Buddha, he was able to guide children to attain enlightenment as early as age seven. And I figured, okay, if the Buddha was able to guide children to get to enlightenment by age seven, he must have started prior to that. So at the time that I was ready to start teaching, my lion was six. So it was a perfect time for me to start actively teaching him something like impermanence and other things like this. So there's the foundation that needs to be built, just like I teach in this program where there's the three universal truths first, then there's the four noble truths, and then building up to the Eightfold Path. The same sequence of teachings that I share in this book and in this program, that's what I did with Bailan, but I just did it orally and through examples and through fun and games rather than having him read a book and attend classes. Thank you, that, that helps a lot. And my second question, which is all I have for now, is can you explain in more detail about um, how to play the concentration game? Because I think that will be a great game for um, children who are young, and I just don't understand how to do this play 100%. Yeah, so the way that this works, depending on the age of the child, you know, you take a, a deck of cards, which usually has 52 cards in it. And when Byline was younger, you know, we would use fewer cards you know, maybe 15 or 20 cards or something like that. But then as he aged and he got better at it, we would add more and more of the cards. What you do is you mix them all up and you put them all face down and kind of lay them out like in a grid pattern. And then the first person goes, they turn over one card and let's just say that's a king of diamonds. And then they turn over another card and that's like a nine of clubs. That's not a match. So then they would turn them back over face down and then the next person would go so now the next person turns over another king and now that person has to remember where was the other king in all of these cards that are laying face down where was the other king and now they have to go find it and if they find it it's a match and now they've got two cards that match and they get to keep that as like a little book and then after all the cards are matched up whoever has the most books has essentially won the game but the real uh winning the real benefit is that people are cultivating their mind to have memory and concentration and remember where these cards are laid out and initially when you first get going it's a little bit more challenging because there's more cards but as the books get made it becomes easier and easier so this is the way that you can play with children a game that cultivates concentration Another game that you can use is, you know, you can take a bowl and you can fill the bowl all the way up to the rim with water. Um, and then you can carry it back and forth. You know, you can have one team on one side, and another team on the other side. And the goal isn't to do it quickly, but it's to whoever has the most water at the end of the game. So you can have, uh, uh, you know, individual cups or individual bowls and then they have to scoop up the water and they have to carry this bowl really, really slowly to the other side and accumulate a certain amount of water and go back and forth and go back and forth. And whoever is able to carry the water uh, and they're able to uh, have it up as high as possible, they have more water. But what they're doing is they're 
cultivating mindfulness and concentration as they're carrying this water back and forth in the yard or wherever they are uh, in, ho in the home, as they're carrying that water, it requires a lot of mindfulness and awareness of mind and concentration to be able to carry this back and forth. So there's these types of games and others that you can find online that will help you to allow the child to do a fun game, but ultimately what they're doing is they're cultivating mindfulness and concentration. Okay, so so one last thing. Um, those are the only two questions I had, and your, your answers helped me a lot. But one last comment um, before I, I open to everybody else is I think the concentration game for kids, I also suspect it would be very helpful for adults. And the reason why I say that is sometimes I have memory issues, short-term memory and things like that. I think playing it with my son would be good for him, but I also suspect there's a chance it may also improve my memory. Yes, it absolutely will. Uh, anybody who plays it is going to help them. I played this growing up as a kid. I learned how to play it with adults, but I also played it quite often by myself. I played this game quite a bit um, as I played by myself. I used to do this a lot to train the mind. Another game that I played growing up, and I did this with Bailan as well, is that say I'm downstairs and uh, I need to leave and Bailan and I need to go somewhere together, like to a store or something, and say that my car keys, my driver license, my mobile phone, my money, and different things like this are upstairs in my room. I might say, hey, Bailan, dad has this game I, I would like you to play. It's called See How Many Things You Can Remember. And he's like, all right. And I was like, you know, I need you to go up to my room and I need you to get my driver's license, my mobile phone, my keys, and my money. And he's like, all right, he might be repeating those in the mind. Then he goes upstairs and he has to remember to get those things. And that might be just on the way out the door. But sometimes we would play this game just you know for the heck of it so to speak where i might start with three items and it's like all right go upstairs to dad's room and get my um you know book get this get that three things then he remembers those three things and he brings them downstairs and then i'm then i'll increase it to four then i'll increase it to five and then six and seven and the game is to see how many items he can remember you know can he remember up to seven eight nine ten how many items can he remember and each time he's taking in information from his dad he has to remember that he has to walk upstairs calmly and he needs to go into the room and calmly pick these things up and then bring them to me. And then we go through all of those things that he remembered to bring. So these are type games. And I used to do this one a lot when I was a child. My family was helping me to cultivate concentration and memory. And I would play these type of games all the time. And then sometimes he's going to my room. Sometimes he's going to the kitchen. Sometimes he needs to get two things from the kitchen and three things from my room or something like this. And this is really, really helpful for the mind to cultivate memory. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question, Chris. Thank you. Um, Bassam has his hand raised, sir. Bassam, we're not hearing you yet. I'm not sure if your microphone's working. It looks like your mute's off, but we're not hearing you. Looks like we might need to go to someone else while Boston works on that, Chrissy. Okay. Um, Miranda also has a question on Facebook. Yes, thank you, Chrissy. On Facebook, Amina asks, you mentioned not force your children to meditate. What about starting to meditate where they might see you as a gentle reminder? Our daughter stopped meditating, and I'm interested in your guidance. Thank you, sir. Yeah, that's the way you would like it to be. You would like it to be the decision of the child rather than you forcing them to meditate. So at one point in Bailan's training, he's been training for four years actively since age six. Now he's 10. There was a period of time where, you know, I was encouraging him to meditate and he developed a meditation practice for about two weeks and then he stopped meditating. And uh, I would be interested in, of course, in him meditating. So once every three months, once every six months, I might remind him to consider to meditate or encourage him to meditate. But for the last four years, he hasn't done that. 
Um, but if I were to force him or try to control him to do that, he's not going to like that. He's just going to dig his feels, heels in. He's going to be resentful that his dad is forcing him to meditate. It's not going to be a fun thing for him to do. So instead, I just you know reminded him occasionally here and there. And then what ended up occurring is uh, he got really, really angry uh, th about two or three weeks ago, uh, so much so that he was yelling and his face turned red and I'd never seen this from him ever in his entire life. And after he calmed down and we had a nice talk about it, I started also talking to him after he cultivated the wisdom for that situation. I started talking to him about, you know, I bet you felt, you know, quite miserable as you were so angry and yelling. You know, I could tell you must have just been so irritated. Uh, did you enjoy that? You know, was it a nice feeling? You know, I was asking him these different questions. And of course, he was like, no, I didn't like it at all, Dad. I didn't enjoy yelling. It, it didn't feel good. You know, so we kind of like made sure he understood that part of it. And then I said, you know, there's one thing that I've been teaching throughout uh, your life that you just aren't doing yet. And if you were doing that one thing, it would really actually help you quite a bit. Do you know what that is? And he's like, yeah, and I've been thinking about doing that. You know, that was meditation. He, he explained that he knew that it was meditation. So about two or three weeks ago, he came up with a plan that he was going to start meditating on the weekends. And that was going to be his way of starting meditation. And he was going to meditate for five minutes per session on Saturday, one session and Sunday, one session. And now it's been about three weekends that he's been meditating uh, on Saturday and Sunday for five minutes per session. And what he tells me is that he's going to then expand that into the weekdays that right now he would like to just meditate on the weekends. And I'm just like, all right, you know, it's up to him. It's his choices. I'm not trying to control what he does with that. But as your child sees you meditate, it might incentivize them to meditate uh, with Bailan. You know, he's seen me meditate a whole, whole lot, but he's still has been somewhat complacent about his meditation because his life is pretty peaceful. You know, his parents never yell at him. He, he doesn't have any kind of uh, spanking or punishments or anything like this. He he's actively learning. He's, um, you know, developing his understanding of the path, but his life is fairly peaceful here. So oftentimes an individual needs to experience you know, quite a bit of painful feelings before they're motivated out of their complacency. So when I noticed that he experienced some really deep, painful feelings with the anger from a few weeks ago, that's when I thought I would raise it to his attention that the way to eliminate that 100% so that he never needs to feel that again is with meditation. And it seems like he said he was already thinking about doing meditation anyway. So different children are going to do different things right what i'm sharing with you here in terms of the teachings is you know how to think about sharing these teachings with your child but how you implement what you choose to implement is going to be unique to you in your personality as well as unique to your child and your child's personality so you shouldn't take what i'm sharing as this is absolutely the way to do it for all children because that would be permanence. It's not possible. So you don't shouldn't feel like you need to wait for your child to get angry to introduce them to meditation. But instead, if your child's showing interest in meditation just by observing you meditate, that's wonderful. You know, encourage that, support that. Um, but if you are noticing that your children aren't meditating uh, and they're uh, reluctant to do so, you might use some of the guidance that I'm providing that I did with Bailan, that where I saw that his mind got really angry and experienced those painful feelings. I use that as a way to help him see that meditation is the solution to solving that. Thank you, sir. Um, it seems Bonasam was struggling with his microphone. So he asks on Zoom, is there anything that could be done to help a child to eliminate their attachment, for example, to a mobile phone, if they have not made their decision to do the work to eliminate this attachment? Yes. So this is where parents can create a, a situations where a child's going to need to eliminate their mobile phone, or I'm sorry, eliminate their attachment. And uh, what you can do is you can uh, you know, create environments where their mind needs to let this go. So let's just say they're playing with their mobile phone. 
uh, they're on the sofa and they put their mobile phone down and you know they're attached to it. They put their phone down and they get up and go to the bathroom. The parent can go over there, pick up the mobile phone and put it somewhere else in the house. And then when they come back, of course, they're going to be looking for the mobile phone um, and they're going to be looking around on the sofa. They're probably going to be getting upset and frustrated. They might even look to you and say, you know, what did you do with my mobile phone? I know you did something with it. Um, you're not interested in lying, so you're not going to say like, I don't know where your mobile phone is. You're not going to say that because you do know where it's at. You might say, oh, where did you leave it? Right. You just ask them a question back. You're like, well, where did you leave it? And they're like, I left it on the sofa. And you're like, well, is it still there? And they're like, no, it's not there anymore. Well, where is it? You know, so you just ask them questions and then they're going to be looking around perhaps frantically because of their craving. And then you can be there to guide them and you can say, you know, just let that go. You know, it's just a phone. Why don't we do something else? Let's play some cards or let's go outside and ride bikes. Or, you know, you're trying to redirect their mind to something else to train their mind to let go of the phone because they might be frantically looking for the phone for a while and maybe even getting upset. And then you redirect them towards something else and then go do something else for a a while and then at some point when it's convenient for you and the child's not around you go get that phone and you put it back on the sofa and don't tell them about it just let them kind of happen into it and then they observe like oh wow the phone's here i'm gonna wonder what happened to it and you're just like well it's there now it doesn't really matter uh you know you got your phone now and you're going to need to do these kind of things multiple times before their attachment gets eliminated. So Bailan has been attached to his computer for a really long period of time. And one of the things that I would do is do this where, you know, I would uh, remove the computer out of his ability to to use it. I did that for many, 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 many times. Sometimes I'll even go over to him and I'll talk to him and I'll kind of push the computer screen down because it's a laptop. I'll push the computer screen down and start talking to him um, so that he's playing a game. And then I push the computer screen down and kind of interrupt his game. Right. So this is like introducing impermanence into the situation because the mind's going to want to hold on to this electronic device and it's going to crave permanence. And what you would like to do is introduce impermanence into the situation. And then where you see that your child might start getting wise to some of the things you're doing, like maybe now instead of putting their phone on the sofa before they go to the bathroom, they might take the phone with them in the bathroom. And then where you see that, you're just like, no, 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 we're, we're not going to take phones into the bathroom. This is very unwise. It can fall in the toilet and, you know, get uh, damaged. So just just leave that outside. And they're like, yeah, but you're going to take it well, I don't have any plans to do that. And then you kind of do this, you know, every three days, every four days, once a week, um, and realize that it's a real commitment to help an individual to let go of their attachments. And over the last four years, I've had to do a lot of this with Bailan. I've done these things with his mom as well. Um, different things where the mind has the potential to get attached that you will need to do these types of things. And you can even do things where you get ahead of the curve on attachment too. There was a period of time where Bailan kept asking for a PlayStation and to get a PlayStation 5. And of course, I'm not going to buy him a PlayStation 5 with uh, any donations that I'm getting from students because that is to sustain my life and to help us to build our community. So I let him know straight out, like, there's no way I'm going to be getting you a PlayStation 5. So as we talked about this more and more, there was a time when I was in business that I bought him a gold necklace and it came to my mind. I was like, you know, he never wears this gold necklace. Why don't I suggest to him to sell this gold necklace and then he can use that to buy his PlayStation 5. And when he got that idea, he really liked it. And he's like, yeah, that's what I'll do is I'll sell the gold necklace and buy the PlayStation 5. Well, because I knew his mind was most likely going to be attached to this PlayStation 5 and at the time, PlayStation 5 was sold out. What we did is as we would go shopping and he would walk through the mall, he would see a certain store have a sign outside about a PlayStation. And I know that all these stores are sold out. And he would be like, Dad, Dad, there's a store that has a PlayStation 5. I, I want to go in there and uh, see if they've got it. And I was like, all right, go ahead, go ask them. Um, rather than me going in to ask, I sent him into the store because then when he asked for the PlayStation 5, if he's craving it and the person says, no, we don't have it, 
if he's craving it, he's going to experience certain painful feelings like frustration or irritation or annoyance. So because I knew he was getting to the point where he was going to end up buying a PlayStation 5 for about one year, this is something that we talked about at different times when we were in the malls at different times. He went into probably five, eight, ten different stores you know, asking if they had PlayStation 5. I knew that none of these stores had it, but I still you know, suggested to him, I was like, oh, look, here's a place that has a PlayStation 5. Maybe you should go ask them. And he's like, all right. So he would go in and he would ask them and he kept getting turned down over and over and over and over again. And now he's got a PlayStation 5, but he only plays it occasionally. He's more into the computer than he even is the PlayStation 5. So if you know that you're going to purchase something for a child and there's a potential for their mind to get attached to it, you can do things like this where you introduce some impermanence. Let me give you another example. Say you have a daughter or a son who wants a brand new pair of shoes and this really great new pair of shoes. And you've decided that, yeah, you're going to buy this pair of shoes for them. And they know that you're going to buy this pair of shoes for them. And you guys have talked about it. And now's the weekend that you're going to the store to buy these shoes for them. You can actually, they can know that, hey, you're going to the store to buy shoes for them. But then on the way to the store, you can be like, you know what? I've changed my mind. Uh, we're not going to be able to go to the mall today. Let's go do this other thing that that I need to do. I need to go to the post office or I need to go to pick up dry cleaning or something else. You can uh, have the plan to go get these shoes and then you actually change the plan. And this is where it's important that you don't have an attachment to the child because they're going to most likely get discontent in that situation. And when they get discontent, you need to just understand that this is part of the process, that their discontentedness is going to need to arise and then they're going to need to cut it off and let it go. And I didn't start doing these kind of things until Bailan already understood the three universal truths and the four noble truths. He had an understanding of the Eightfold Path. And I could guide him when he got discontent. I could be like, well, you know what you need to do with that, right? And he's like, yeah, I need to cut it off and let it go. I'm like, all right, perfect. So cut that off and let it go um, so that you're not discontent. So you're not doing these things in any kind of malicious way um, or being vindictive. But instead, you're doing it with loving kindness and compassion, realizing that if you allow your child to continue to have these cravings, desires, attachments, that they're going to experience these painful feelings at some point. So you would rather that occur while you're there so that you can then guide them through it and help them over it so that then that is no longer a craving that exists in their mind. Whereas if you just... If they got excited about the shoes, you went to the store, you bought the shoes, you brought them home. They're so excited about those shoes, they're going to experience painful feelings related to the shoes at some point anyway. So you might as well do it while you're there and you're able to guide them through it and kind of get to the head of the curve where you can help ensure they don't have a craving before they even purchase the shoes. And these are just some examples that you can do. Thank you. Those are great examples. Um, Fossum also asks, as for children who have attained enlightenment at the age of seven, were they ordained practitioners necessarily or household practitioners? So a person can actually fully ordain until they're 20 years old. The Buddha you know, had that as part of what he would do because early on they can come live with the Buddha and they're what's considered a novice. Um, you know, we call them novice monks, but uh, they call them nans, uh, N-A-N. And this individual would wear a robe, they would shave their head, they would live side by side with the Buddha, but they weren't considered to be ordained yet until they actually got to 20. But anybody that would have gotten to enlightenment at the age of seven based on the Buddha's instruction would have been living with the Buddha, I'm sure. Because if you're living with a Buddha, if you're around a Buddha, they're going to do things in a skillful way to help ensure that you get to enlightenment. And this is one of the benefits of being around a teacher is that a teacher is going to be functioning in a way that helps you to get to enlightenment and doing some of these 
things that I'm describing where a teacher can create situations where the individual can see their attachments arise and then have the opportunity, I'm sorry, they can see their discontentedness arise based on their attachments and then they have the opportunity to eliminate it as part of their practice. So I suspect that anybody who attained enlightenment at the age of seven based on the instruction of the Buddha, that they would be living side by side with the Buddha. And this was common during his lifetime that children and even uh, teenagers, young adults would leave home, uh, even adults would leave home to come live with the Buddha. He would almost be like an adopted father or, or a stepfather and teaching uh, these individuals, you know, all aspects of life, including the path to enlightenment. And then as part of that, creating environments in situations in which people have the opportunity to eliminate their attachments. Um, awesome. Um, so says thank you. Thank you. And um, I have a question um, to how if if the child isn't as exposed to the teachings, um, how would you skillfully then redirect a child's mind if you are trying to eliminate attachment to a device and you take the device away. Um, I would imagine there's going to be extreme discontentment. Um, you, you had mentioned like redirecting, going and doing something. What if that doesn't work, going and doing something else? Would, how do you introduce the object back? So they're, So if they're discontent, you're not interested in introducing the object back into the situation because that's just going to reinforce their discontentedness. Because if they're becoming frustrated and irritated and they're not willing to go out and ride a bike, for example, and let go of the phone, and you're like, okay, well, here's your phone. Now what you've just taught them is, okay, when you get frustrated and irritated, if you don't let it go, mom's going to give you the phone back. Um, and this just reinforces like, okay, I'm going to, I'm justified in having these feelings and it's beneficial for me to have these feelings because I just got my phone back. So if they're frustrated and irritated and you're working to redirect their mind and saying, hey, let's go outside and ride a bike. And they're like, no, I don't want to ride a bike. I want to find my phone. Okay, well, you stay here and find your phone. I'm going out to ride a bike. And you just need to be comfortable leaving them there and you go outside for a walk or ride your bike. This is where you need to be unattached to them and realize that they're going to need to process that. And that's part of the path, part of that struggle, because eventually they're going to need to eliminate the, the craving desire attachment because that frustration is not permanent. And the only way for their mind to be able to get back to some kind of normalcy is they have to let go of the attachment. So you're not interested in reintroducing the item until you've observed that there's uh, been a period of time where they've let it go and they've now moved on to something else. Whether it was your suggestion that they moved on to riding a bike or they just chose to go do something themselves. And then you would like to elongate that. Maybe it's not even that you bring it back in the same day. It might be uh, a day or two or three later that the phone comes up. And even if they don't understand the teachings and they haven't been actively learning, this is a way for you to actually help them to learn them. So if somebody, if a child hasn't been learning the teachings and they don't understand when their mind gets discontent in the moment, you can actually be teaching them about craving desire attachment. So one of the things that I did with Bailan early on when he first learned, started learning about impermanence and craving desire attachment, he was really into building Legos. And when he went to school, I uh, broke up some of his Legos and I laid them out on the table. Uh, so that when he came home, he saw the Legos that were broken up. Um, and right away when he came in, he started crying and he was really upset. And I came over and I was like, what's going on, Bailan? Why are you so upset? He's like, my Legos, my Legos. You know, they're all they're all broken up. And I was like, well, you know, they were together, but that's impermanent. So now they're they've fallen apart. Uh, but them falling apart and being apart, that's impermanent, too. You can put them back together. Um, so slowly but surely he gained his composure and then he put them back together. 
And then we talked about craving and that his mind was craving permanence and wanting these Legos to be permanent, but they're not permanent. So then about three or four days later, he went to school again and I broke them up again. And then he came home and he saw them and he got frustrated. He didn't break out in, in tears and upset the way that he was the first time. It was less. It had diminished, but he was still frustrated and he was still really annoyed. And But he realized um, that he could put them back together. He just started working on them and putting them back together himself and then like uh you know another four five six days later he went to school and i broke him up again and then when he came home he saw it and he started laughing and he looked at me and he was like you broke all my legos didn't you i was like yep i sure did he's like all right well i'm just going to put them back together there was no crying no discontentedness nothing whatsoever and it took you know two times of being discontent to ultimately get to the third one where he wasn't discontent and that's where you as a parent when you see this occur you know that that crying and the discontentedness that he experienced the first two times you need to go through that in order to get to the other side where now his mind's completely peaceful and now if his toys break or something like this he's never discontent about it because he's already trained his mind to let this go and i just created the environment and the situation that would allow him to do that if you're uh holding on and you struggle to see your child discontent in those first two situations a parent most likely isn't going to be willing to do those things but if you're willing to do that and you realize it's part of getting to the other side where their mind can be peaceful and joyful then you'll be able to be comfortable in doing these things Thank you, sir. I believe that's all the questions we have right now. Okay. So now let's talk about being comfortable with mistakes because your children are going to make mistakes and you're going to make mistakes as well. So as you're sharing these teachings with your children, as I mentioned, they're not going to learn them the first time and then perform them perfectly because of that gradual training, gradual practice and gradual progress. But also as you're coming up with different ideas and unique ways to introduce them to these teachings, you're gonna make mistakes too. You're going to introduce them to a certain thing, you're gonna play a certain game or whatever, or you're gonna come up with some way of introducing a certain uh, uh, concept to them or a certain teaching or a certain way of practice, and you're gonna realize that it's not working. And you're gonna to need to be willing to let that go and then change gears and move to something else. So mistakes is part of the process. There's no, no human being alive that hasn't made mistakes in their life, but the challenge is, is that oftentimes when there is a mistake, someone might beat themselves up and feel like they're, they're failing. But if you understand that if the goal is to acquire wisdom and that's what your actual goal is, then there's no such thing as failure. Because even when you implement something, if you made a mistake and now you need to change to do something else, you learned something from that mistake. You realized what was not working and now you've been able to change to another direction and do something differently based on the wisdom of that mistake you grew in your understanding and now you're able to implement and introduce something else that is better suited to teach that particular teaching. So understand that your mistakes and your children's mistakes is part of the process. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be, you know, unwrapping a gift in a perfect way and then bada bing, bada boom, you know, everybody is peaceful and joyful and content in the household, it's going to get messy sometimes and that's okay. It's impermanence, right? So as you see that they're making mistakes, be patient, guide them, but then also be comfortable with your own mistakes and understand trial and error. That sometimes you're going to try a certain game or you're going to try to introduce something. Sometimes it's going to work right out of the box. Other times it's not. In each one of those mistakes, you're learning something about your child's mind. You're learning about how they how they think and how they learn. And you're learning something about how to take these teachings from the classes that I share and put them into little lessons that your children can understand. And you'll get better and better at that to the point where ultimately you'll be able to take a certain teaching or a con, uh, something that you're learning in terms of the practice of these teachings and you'll be able to introduce it without any mistakes but it's going to take you a while of going through these mistakes 
uh, both on your part and your children's part before you get really good at taking something that you learned from the Buddhist teachings and figuring out how to introduce it to a child in a way that they can understand. So sharing teachings with, uh, with a child, there's repeated efforts to learn and grow in presenting these teachings to a child and understand that trial and error is all part of it. And as you're doing that, there's kind of two different aspects of training for a child. There's what I call proactive training, and then there's real-time training. The proactive training is introducing the teachings like the three universal truths, the four noble truths, the eightfold path, the five precepts, meditation, and things like this in a proactive way. That's where you know I'm talking to Bailan, I'm explaining to him about impermanence, we come up with a little game, we go outside, and we do a scavenger hunt looking for impermanence in the world. This is proactive training, right? The real time training is kind of like as part of the daily struggles of life, where like I was talking about where, uh, you know, he maybe comes home and he sees that a toy is broken or his mind is discontent in the moment. And I'm offering him some guidance in the moment to actually help him to overcome that struggle. And sometimes these are just little 30 second things. Sometimes they're, they're longer. So you can be teaching your child in a proactive way, certain teachings, and you can be teaching them real time as their mind is actually discontent, providing them the right teaching at the right time. So if they're struggling with impermanence and their mind is craving and they're discontent because of that, then that might be what you're sharing with them. Or if they're having trouble practicing loving kindness and they're having anger coming up, you might be providing them a teaching on loving kindness. Or they might be jealous and they might be having jealousy towards somebody. And then you need to teach them sympathetic joy. So the more wisdom that you have, which is the very first thing that I was talking about, you'll be able to spot in your child that they're having jealousy. And you know the remedy to that is sympathetic joy. Or they're having anger and the remedy to that is loving kindness. Or they're having discontentedness and you know that they need to cut that off and let it go. So the more developed that your practice is, the more you'll be able to guide them through this proactive training and this real time training. And this proactive training, it can be the games and the fun and the activities that I'm talking about already, but it can also be these little 15 second, 30 second things as you're driving down the road. As Bailan started learning about impermanence and all these other things, there was a couple of times where we were driving down the road and there was a dead dog that got hit by a car and it was laying on the side of the road and he saw it. He was like, dad, is that a dead dog? I was like, I think so. I was like, you know, what is that? What does that represent? And he was like, what do you mean? I was like, in regards to the teachings of the Buddha, you know, why did that animal die? He's like, oh, because he was born, he had to die. He was, he's impermanent. That dog is impermanent. I'm like, ah, excellent. So he was able to process death and understand death through seeing these things and then connecting it to the teachings. And there was just maybe 15 seconds or 30 seconds or a little minute thing. And then we were off, you know, we were driving in the car, we were doing the next thing. So don't feel like your teaching needs to always be, you know, this, you know, 10 minute talk with a one hour game and all of these kind of things. Of course, you're going to have some of those things, but sometimes your teachings are just little by little by little. Uh, if you're driving in the car and somebody's honking their horn and really angry and angrily, you know, laying on their horn, I might mention to Bailan, I'm like, you know, why do you think that that's happening? Oh, because he's craving. So he's experiencing anger. Yep, that's right. Right? We're not judging the person. We're not talking bad about it. He's just observing what's happening in the world and being able to process it through the, the teachings that he understands. So this is proactive training versus real-time training. And realize you're going to need a combination of both of these. Uh, be prepared for detours. This is really important. As you're uh, progressing in life, as you guys are moving to uh, different activities in your life, whether you're going to school or you're going to the mall or you're going out to eat or you're going out to do things in the yard. 
understand that they're going to have challenges along the way. They're going to get discontent perhaps as they're putting on their shoes or maybe if they have another sibling, their sibling might be uh, fighting or upset with each other. If you're having craving, desire, attachment to hurry up and get to the mall <clears throat> or to hurry up and get to football practice or soccer practice, then your mind might be fixated on hurrying up and getting to that objective if you have craving, desire, attachment. But if you understand that there's going to need to be detours, that the real goal in this life is for you to help your children cultivate wisdom, the real goal isn't to get to football practice. The real goal isn't to get to soccer practice. The real goal isn't to get to the mall. The goal is to cultivate wisdom so that the children, when they arrive to football practice, their mind is peaceful and joyful. Or when they arrive to the mall, their mind is peaceful and joyful. So if you're on the way to something and your child is struggling, you need to be prepared to put a pause on whatever activity you're doing or the movement towards the objective to take some time to provide a teaching. So there were times where Bailan and I would be on our way to play miniature golf, for example. And along the way, he might have ego that comes up and I would see his ego come up. And I would realize that it wasn't a good idea for him to, to go play mini golf because he might be in the car starting to do a little trash talking about how he's going to beat dad and mini golf. And I'm like, you know, I don't really enjoy playing mini golf with people who have a lot of ego. I think we should just go back home. And then I would just, you know, turn the car around and go back home. And of course, he might be upset. He might be discontent because he really wanted to go play mini golf. Um, so he's getting kind of two things, right? He's learning to let go of his attachment to the mini golf, but he's also learning that people don't enjoy playing with you when you have ego. So if you understand these fetters and you understand the Eightfold Path and you understand all the different aspects of the teachings where you see your child is struggling, be prepared for detailers and understand that if you have a craving to get to the mini golf and that's what you want to do and you're trying to please your child with the mini golf, then this is just feeding your own craving and perhaps feeding their craving. That in some situations where you see that they're not practicing the teachings, you might just need to take a detour. And this one that I just described is just, you know, turning around and going back home, which um, may not always be the situation. And if you're doing that, you aren't doing it at being vindictive. You're not punishing your child. You're not doing anything like that. You're just kind of politely, kindly, respectfully helping them realize that you're not interested in playing mini golf with someone who has ego. And maybe you've tried to talk to them a little bit and try to help them to let go of their ego so they realize that. But then ultimately, if they're not willing to let it go and the ego persists, then maybe that's when you turn around and decide not to play mini golf. In other situations, in terms of a detour, say that you're going with your children and say you have more than one child and say they're putting on their shoes and putting on their jackets and they're arguing and festering and fighting with each other. Uh, and now you realize that you're on your way somewhere and they're arguing and festering and fighting. And when they get in the car, that's just going to continue. What you would like to do is put a pause on that. And, and perhaps you need to talk with them and help them understand that this isn't the best way for them to go forward in their day by being argumentative with each other. And you'd like them to pause, take off their shoes, take off their jackets perhaps, go back into the house and start this over and do it in a really nice, polite and kind way. This can be a way to kind of repeat the situation. And if you're willing to take a detour and you're not having craving to just get to the event, then you're willing to put a pause on those things. Or here's another simple example. Bailan used to have this habit of coming into my room and he would just barge into the room because here in Thailand, we tend to keep our doors closed because we don't have central air conditioning in Thailand. Each individual room has an individual air conditioner. So we keep our doors closed and we have a remote control to turn on the air conditioner in each individual room. So I could be working on the computer or talking to a student or something like that. And he could barge into my room and make all kinds of noise. And then when he would barge in, I would just say, hold on a moment. Uh, Daddy would like you to try to do that again, but enter the room a bit more politely, a bit more kindly, not so aggressively. Can you step outside and try to come back into the room a bit nicer? 
So then he would go outside the room, he would politely close the door, he would pause out there for a second, and then he would politely come into the room, uh, and then he would politely shut the door. But I had to do that with him kind of 15, 20 times, 30 times, before he started doing that more and more readily on his own. Because you can't just teach a child something one time and then they do it. So where you see that they're doing these things, be prepared to take a detour and just kind of pause things give them a little bit of wisdom of what it is that you would like them to do and then have them repeat that situation and this is where they're kind of rewiring their mind whereas if you taught them to uh, come in the door nicely but then they don't come back into your room for another week or two or three it's going to be a long time from the time you taught them the wisdom until the time that there is a potential for them to use it again. So they're less likely to implement the wisdom that you've shared with them because it's a week, two or three before they need that again. So if you have them repeat the task, whether it's coming into the room, whether it's putting on their shoes and moving to the car in a polite and kind way, in a peaceful way, whether it's not having ego on the way to mini golf or something like this, have them repeat that, right? There's even been times where I've been on the way to mini golf, he's had ego, uh, I've talked with him about it, he wouldn't let it go, so I decided to turn the car around, we're on the way home, we're still talking, and he might say, you know, Dad, I see you're right, I did have ego, this was really wrong of me, I shouldn't do this, and I'm gonna work on this and get better at not having ego in the future. I'm like, you know what? I really like how you just said that. That was really polite. That was really insightful that you realize that this isn't the way you would like to practice. Since you just shared that, I'm gonna turn around again and let's actually go to mini golf because you just had some real deep reflection and I think that's some real growth on your part. I really admire that. Let's go have some fun and play mini golf together. So there's been times where I've done two U-turns in order to, um, you know, help him see the things that he needs to do in order to reflect on his conduct, reflect on his thinking, because the ultimate goal isn't to actually get to the mini golf. I could, you know, really care less whether we play mini golf or not. What my goal is, is to guide this individual to learning how to make wise decisions and where I see him being insightful and having some deep thought and, and coming up with really wise answers, then I'm going to potentially reward that through being encouraging and being supportive and what it is that I'm sharing with him. I'm going to be uplifting and helping him to grow through being polite, kind, friendly, and respectful at all times, helping to kind of uplift his learning, right? I'm not being uh, degrading or I'm not trying to make him angry intentionally or you know being uh, you know bitter or aggressive or anything like that but instead I'm looking to be supportive for this child and there's even been times where as I've been training him you know it's a real struggle for him and he'll even tell me you know dad you don't love me anymore you know you don't love me because this is so difficult for me and I'm like well uh, you know, that's not true. I absolutely love you. And that's exactly why I do what I do. But of course, while he's angry and he's upset, he's not understanding that. So I'll wait until he calms down and then we'll kind of revisit that and I'll help him see how he's um, overcoming a lot of these challenges and his mind is getting more and more peaceful. And it's actually a, a lot more work for dad to teach him and guide him in this way. But this is the most loving and kind thing that I could ever do for him. So in the moment when he's angry, he might say things that he hasn't really thought through and he might say, ah, you don't love me anymore. Well, you know the truth that you do love them. So even when you hear that from them, you need to be unaffected by that, but still be supportive and encouraging. And sometimes it just means that you might be quiet when your child is angry in the car and you might just be quiet and just let them be angry and, and that's okay. Um, but other times you might be guiding them to cut that off and let it go. So you've got to kind of work with this and see through trial and error what's working best with your child, but always being supportive and encouraging and uplifting, really accentuating the positive and how you're guiding your child. Because if we only point out the mistakes that they're making and the negative things, and that's what we're giving attention to, 
then when they're interested in attention from you, they're going to be doing the negative things because that's what they would like to do in order to get your attention. But if you're able to be supportive and encouraging and accentuating the positive things that they're doing, then they're going to be more likely to actually do those things. So there were times where Bailan in the past had a very contentious relationship with his mom and they were really struggling in the way that they interacted with each other. So as I started teaching him right speech and learning how to speak with his mom in more polite ways, when I would see him practice right speech, you know, I would tell him like, wow, Bailan, I really like how kind you were with your mom there. That was really nice of you. You know, high five or give me a hug or, you know, a rub on top of the head or something like this. There's uh, times where he was speaking unkind and then his mom at that time would, you know, yell back at him. And then I could tell that he would get um, upset and I would just walk away and let him deal with those uh, feelings. And then I might come back like an hour later and we would have a talk and I'd be like, do you know why your mom yelled at you? And he's like, yeah, she was using wrong speech. Yeah, but you were also using wrong speech too. If you weren't using wrong speech, she wouldn't have used wrong speech. And then I would tell her, you know, I'm not excusing that your mom shouldn't have been using wrong speech. You know, that's her practice. But right now we're talking about your practice. Uh, you know, what could you have done better in this situation in terms of the five factors of well-spoken speech to ensure that you're speaking uh, in a best way that won't uh, allow somebody's mind to, to do those kind of things. So there are times early on where them two were still, you know, arguing with each other. And if my wife were to yell at him, um, I'm not going to just jump in and, you know, shelter him from that. Instead, he needed to see that it was his speech that was leading to that. And then he had to experience that uh, interaction with his mom. And then I could show him how to improve it for the future. And then as he did that and he saw the relationship improve, where now they don't yell and they're not upset with each other, they have a peaceful relationship. Now you can see that he's improved that. But what I would always do is be supportive and encouraging rather than uh, demeaning or degrading or diminishing and telling him how wrong he was with his speech, I would help guide him to be able to look at his speech himself so that he could identify the areas that he was struggling with. You know, did you speak at the right time? Is what you said true? Did you speak gently? Did you speak beneficially? Did you speak with a mind of loving kindness? Which one of these factors or more did you uh, have a challenge practicing and let him identify it. And this is the way for him to bring the teachings up into the mind. So you can be supportive and encouraging for 95, 98% of the time so that then when you do need to sit down those certain times and really point out the areas of mistakes, they're going to be more receptive to it because you've spent so much time accentuating the positive and being encouraging and uplifting with them. It's important when you're talking to your children that you eliminate any anger or aggressiveness that you have. If you are having anger or aggressiveness, that's not the right time for you to be uh, talking with your child and trying to guide them on this path. If you're shouting or you're hitting or you're spanking, it's really important not to do any of those things because all it does is creates fear in the relationship and it distances your children from you where uh, they're not going to be able to actually be learning and progressing because they're going to be demotivated. If you're trying to teach them about things like right intention, right speech, and right action in terms of practicing things like harmlessness and loving kindness and not causing harm through our bodily actions, if you're shouting or hitting or spanking your child, the child's going to get very confused and ultimately demotivated because on one side you're trying to teach them to do things in a certain way, but yet you're not practicing it yourself. So that's why it's really important that you're not doing those things, but even to the point where if you observe that your mind's angry or discontent, that you're willing to step away from the situation, 
either in that moment or at any other time and whether it takes a few minutes or a few hours or a few days before then you can reinitiate that conversation having thought through what it is that you're about to talk with your child about so if you have certain things that you're going to teach your child you would like to be very intentional in your teachings and you would like to really reflect on what it is that you're going to teach your child and as you're doing this and you're moving the teachings from what i'm sharing with you and through the books and classes and videos into your own practice and you're working with that then you're working to move it into guiding your child you're going to really need to think through those things and be sure that you're presenting it in a way that's beneficial so if your mind is angry or aggressive in any way and you're trying to present a teaching to them in the heat of the moment it's not going to go over well so it's helpful to ensure that you eliminate those things from your mind so that when you present things to them that you can do that with a calm mind and a peaceful mind and not expecting there to be immediate results when you're uh, presenting these things to your children and then at the same time understand that there are certain times where you might need to use firm speech which is very different than harsh speech because as you may know that the Buddha teaches not to have harsh speech. If you have harsh speech, this is aggressive and bitter and hostile. That's not what you're interested in with anybody, including your children. But with your children, you might need to speak firmly in certain situations. And I'll give you some examples of this. So there's nobody in my life other than my son. And in the past, I would do this occasionally with my wife, but very rarely, mostly with my son. I wouldn't do this with a student or anybody else in my life, but with my son, I, in some cases, need to speak firm. But the firm speech only comes after we've already spent many times talking about a situation and talking about a certain teaching, and I need to get his attention. And in, sometimes speaking firmly allows you to do that. And what I'm going to be doing when I'm speaking firmly is I'm going to be adjusting my tone and my tempo in the way that I speak. I'm going to still be using the same word choices typically, but my tone and my tempo is going to change. So at one time I was working with Bailan to eliminate lying and he was lying at all these different times. And even though I had sat with him and talked with him, we've discussed it six, eight, ten different times, he was continuing to lie. This is what children will typically do. They don't understand the impact of their lying. So after having done that six, eight, ten different times of sitting down, calmly talking, making sure he understands, and he's still lying, I might get to the point where I say, Bailan, this is enough. No more lying. We're done with that lying. Right? This is the tone and the tempo has changed. I might have said in the previous times, I'd be like, you know, Bailan, we're done with this lying. No more lying right? It's the same word choice. I've just firmed up the tone and the tempo a bit so that he knows that I'm really serious about this to get his attention. But I'm only going to probably do this maybe once every three months, once every six months kind of thing. Because if you're using this all the time and it's your go-to way of guiding your child, then it loses its effectiveness. But when you're only doing this occasionally, maybe once every three months at the most, more likely closer to once every six months, then it's more impactful. But if this was the way that you regularly spoke, it wouldn't have the same impact with your child. So you can actually speak firmly with your child, not with aggression, not with hostility, not with anger. You're just increasing your tone or your tempo to firmly talk with the child in a way that catches their attention and they know that you're really serious. And then even after that firm speech, he still lied after that, right? It's not like I'm going to use firm speech and then it's going to immediately eradicate the lying. But after you've sat for six times, eight times or what have you, then you might need to use firm speech. Then you go back to talking some more, having certain talks about lying, for example. And then I might need to go back to firm speech again. You know, so you kind of uh, rotate these things uh, as you're guiding them in any particular teachings or another. Um, <clears throat> it's important that you understand your role is to impart wisdom with your children. 
We're not here to control the child. We're not here to force them to do any one particular thing or another. But instead, what we're working towards is improved decision making uh, for the child. And that's going to require wisdom. So as you're teaching them and you're helping them to gain wisdom, the way that you ensure that they have wisdom is that you ask them questions to confirm their understanding. Uh, that by asking them questions, they then are sharing back with you in their own words whether or not that they're understanding the what you've actually taught them. So you have a vested interest in your child gaining wisdom, not only because it's going to make their life better, not only because they're not going to struggle as much, but at some point in your life, these children are most likely going to be making decisions about your life. As you age and your children are older, they're going to potentially be making decisions about your life. And you would like this child to be as wise as possible so that by the time they're, you've aged and they're now making decisions about your life, that you've taught them uh, in, in a good way. So the way that you uh, confirm that they have wisdom is that you sit back and sometimes you observe the struggle and see what things they're struggling with. And then you step in and provide them guidance. And then as you provide them guidance, you ask them questions to ensure that they understand. So what you guys are going to hear me talk about in a moment is I talk about, you know, not punishing a child, but sometimes there's going to be a need to um, ensure that you get their attention by doing things like maybe not having TV or not having video games or something like this. After you've talked to them multiple times, there might be certain consequences for their conduct. So one of the ways that you can confirm their understanding about something you've taught them is that if you've taught them three, four, five times about something, and then ultimately there's some consequences that are incurred because of them continuing to do this thing that they shouldn't be doing, well, let's just say I take away the TV from Bailan and this is something that he understands that what was going to happen because he's been lying. And then let's just say that he doesn't have TV for three days. And then now that the three days are over, it's not just like, OK, TV's back. Here you go. It's time to go back to TV. Instead, there's a discussion that, OK, it's been three days. Let's sit. Let's talk. Why is it? that you haven't been able to watch TV for the last three days. Oh, it's because I was lying. Is lying helpful? No, it's not helpful, Dad. Why isn't it helpful? What kinds of things does lying lead to? Right. And these are all things that I've taught him, you know, three or four days previous. But you ask him these kind of questions in order to ensure that they're understanding. It still doesn't mean that they're going to eradicate the lying and that they're never going to lie again. But before the TV comes back or before you move on to another topic, even if you're not uh, necessarily looking at something that has been removed in order to get their attention, but even you're just teaching them something and you're getting ready to move on to another task or another activity, or you're moving on to teach them something else, you can ask them questions to confirm their understanding about whatever it is that you just taught them. And I've talked about this a little bit already is these little mini lessons and also repeated tasks is realize that you're going to need to have these little mini lessons. They're not going to sit for a half hour or hour or two hour discourse and learning these things and that they're going to need to repeat tasks. The shorter lessons are oftentimes much more effective with a child. And then once you teach them these lessons, give them an opportunity to do that thing again. So in a situation where I might have observed Bailan talking to his mom in a way that wasn't wise, in some cases, I just let them let it go and allow them to sort it out. And then I follow up with Bailan later. But it also there were situations where he was starting to talk to his mom in unkind ways. And I would step in and I would say, Bailan, hold on a second. That doesn't quite sound like right speech to me. Would you agree is what you just said right speech? And he's like, no, dad, it wasn't right speech. I wasn't being very gentle. I was like, all right, I understand. That's normal. I tell you what, why don't you take a moment, think about it, and then talk to your mom again and try to be more gentle. How about that? He's like, all right, that sounds good. So it's not always about you've done something wrong, you know, 
uh, you're, you're bad for doing this and now you need to be punished for it. This isn't the way that you would like to guide a child. Instead, you're kind of on this parallel process. You're parallel along your child, kind of observing how they interact in the world. Sometimes you might step in and pause them and kind of give them a little 30 second lesson that they can see is true and then give them the immediate opportunity to do it again. Other times you might just allow them to experience the struggle, step back, let them struggle. And then after the struggle and they see the consequences that it didn't go well, you know, wait 30 minutes, wait an hour, and then sit down and talk to them and help them see that that struggle they're dealing with and the consequences they are experiencing is based on their own decisions. So it's not like there's just this one methodology that you're gonna always use. You're gonna use different things in different ways. And as you see different things are working in different situations, you'll build your ability or you'll build your skills and your portfolio of different ways that you can guide your child along the path. The Eightfold Path is the ultimate guide. If you're looking for a way to guide a child, is the more that you learn the Eightfold Path and you practice it, it's the perfect plan to provide guidance to your child. So if you understand something like right view, for example, and this is all about accepting responsibility for your own feelings and uh, that you're causing your own feelings, any kind of anger or hostility, and you're looking to teach this to your child, where you see they might be blaming somebody else for their feelings, you can help them see how it's their craving, desire, attachments that are causing those feelings. Where you see they're not practicing right intention, those three aspects of right intention, which is renunciation, non-ill will, and harmlessness, where you see that they're being harmful, you can step in and help guide them to then practice right intention. Whether you actually call it out as right intention or not is up to you. But where you know that they need to have the intention of harmlessness, where you see that your child's being harmful, you can step in and be like, hold on, um, I feel like you're you know, being a little bit harmful here. Do you feel like this is harmless, what you're doing? And they're like, no, mom, I don't think so. Or, or yes, I think it is harmless. And then you can talk with them and process it. So if you understand all the steps on the Eightfold Path, you can call it out as a particular teaching if they have that level of understanding. Or you can just use some of the wording that the Buddha uses, like with right speech, where he talks about speaking gently. You can say to your child, you know, Bailan, I'm not so sure that this is gentle speech you know what do you think is this a way to speak gently or do you feel like you're being gentle with your brother your sister your mom your dad whoever you they're talking to you can step in and use that same language that the buddha uses to help them recall what it is that you maybe taught them proactively or if it's something that you haven't taught them proactively it's still okay that you step in and share that with them using those same words as the Buddha so that then when you do teach them more proactively, they will connect your words to what it is that they're learning as part of the Eightfold Path. Because the Eightfold Path is the perfect, complete plan for you and for your children too because their mind is going to function the same way as yours. It's just not as mature. And then it's helpful to teach children life skills, things like cooking, cleaning, laundry, ironing, shopping, gardening, exercise, conversation, reading, developing their memory, um, all these different things and others that I have listed here. These are all really helpful for children because yes, they need to cultivate the wisdom of the Eightfold Path and that's what's going to ultimately help them improve their life, but they're also going to need wisdom in all these other areas as well. So helping them to learn these other aspects of life is going to only improve their life as they're able to do things like cooking, cleaning, laundry, and things like this. Let me pause here uh, before we go on to other uh, teachings that I have to share and see what questions you guys might have. Again, you can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Thank you, Teacher David. Um, Tonka has her hand raised. We have a question on YouTube. The middle bit is asking how to apply the teaching you taught if my partner does not do what I do. Do 
Do I keep teaching when only I have a chance? You, yes, you can do it that way. If your partner isn't a practitioner of these teachings, but you are, as you're guiding your child, your child's going to be learning the things that you share with them, and they will probably really appreciate that and learn from you. Uh, early on, my wife didn't understand how to guide Bailan in these teachings. She was learning to practice the teachings herself, but she hadn't yet learned how to guide her son in these teachings. So early on, I was doing a lot of the guidance, and she was trying to do the things that she was doing, but it wasn't working. And slowly but surely, she saw that the way that she was guiding him wasn't working, so she started to adopt more and more of the things that I was doing. And I was kind of showing her how to do the things that I was doing. And what I noticed is that during that period of time where my wife was trying to do things that she knew how to do that weren't really working so well, and I was doing the things from the Buddhist teachings, I was noticing my son was really gravitating towards me in order to learn the things that I had to share with him because he was seeing that they were being helpful in his life. So a child is gonna learn from multiple people. They're not going to learn from just one. So you're just one individual in all of their life that they're going to learn wisdom from. So you can teach them in the way that you would like to teach them. And then your partner is going to teach them in their way. But as you get better and better at this and your child is making improvement through this, your partner may observe that and then choose to start doing things the way that you're doing them. And then they might be interested in learning what it is that you're doing. That's what my wife ended up doing is completely kind of leaving behind the things that she used to do. And now I see her guiding him in the way that I do things. But it took her, you know, kind of like a year and a half, two years, three years to kind of observe how I was doing that and then to start adopting some of that for herself. So if you just do what it is that you know is best, and then uh, continue to get better and better at that, then your child will get the improvement in, through the wisdom that you're sharing, and then your partner will start observing those kind of things as well, and they might actually adopt some of the things that you're doing because they see that it's working. Yes, thank you, sir. And it appears that our, that's all the questions we have right now. Okay. So let's go to some more things that I have to share with you guys related to sharing the path to enlightenment with children. Here's one that I was sharing uh, earlier is ensure that you're not punishing your child. The mindset that we oftentimes grow up with is that somebody does something wrong and they need to be punished for that. And this oftentimes comes from the way that we were guided as we grew up. We might have been uh, uh, punished as a child. So therefore, that's all that we know how to do. So we end up doing the same things. But what this path is about is about, you know, breaking this cycle, this constant cycle of essentially craving anger and ignorance and being in this cycle of doing things in ways that aren't necessarily wise. So even though we might have been guided in one way by our parents, what we can do is we can develop new ways of doing things that we observe that are actually impactful. So as a child growing up, I was constantly punished, but I decided early in life, as early as eight years old, I told myself that I would never hit my child and I've never hit uh, Bailan ever. Um, I knew that that wasn't something I was ever interested in doing and I made that decision when I was eight years old and I stuck to it. Uh, so. If you come from this mindset of punishment, and maybe that is what you have been doing in the past, you can move away from that. And instead, speak to your child, talk to them, have discussions, explain consequences to decisions, and do this calmly when everybody is calm, not in the heat of the moment. Um, and where possible, allow them to come up with the consequences that they're going to face, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to get their attention right by just punishing a child without any kind of discussion or understanding of what's transpiring then they're not going to necessarily learn the lesson that there is to be learned so in certain situations where i might have needed to talk to bailan three four five times about lying and i know that we've talked about this many times and i know that there's the potential that he's going to be lying again in the future maybe on that fourth or fifth time that we've talked about it i might say you know, we've talked about this many times, Bailan. I feel like you have the wisdom that you need to no longer lie. Would you agree with this, that you now know that it's unwise to lie? 
And he's like, yes, dad, I definitely know that. Has dad shared everything that you need to know in order to gain the wisdom that it's not wise to lie? Yes, you sure have, dad. You've shared it with me more than one time, you know, multiple times. Okay, so why don't we do this? If you lie in the future, I think there needs to be some type of consequences here. Uh, because I need to get your attention to realize that this is really serious, that you need to not lie. And he's like, okay, I see where you're going with this. Well, I would like you to pick some consequences of if you lie again, what's going to happen as a result of that? And he's like, well, um, you know, I should lose TV for one day. Only one day? You think one day is enough? I mean, I've already talked with you about this four or five times. You know, is one day really enough? You know, so just because they pick what they're going to receive as consequences doesn't mean you need to agree with it, right? In some cases, what I observed in most situations, Bailan actually picked a, a more significant consequence than I was actually planning to pick. But there were some rare occasions where he picked a consequence less than what I would have uh, selected. Well, if he was going to pick a consequence that was way more than what I selected, I was like, all right, that sounds good to me. Agree, right? But if he picked something that was less than what I was thinking, then it was a discussion about whether this was really a, 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 a consequence that was really going to get his attention or not. And then by the end of our conversation, he agreed and I agreed that if he lied again, that this was going to be the consequence. So then when he lied, he already knew what his consequence was and there wasn't any uh, issues with now fulfilling that consequence. So if the consequence was that he was going to lose TV for three days, he uh, willingly let go of the TV and he realized that, yep, I agreed to this and I'm going to lose the TV for three days or I'm going to lose the computer for five days or what have you. So uh, by having the child uh, have discussions with you for three, four, five times, ensuring that they are saying yes, you have provided all the wisdom that I need in order to know that it's unwise for me to do this particular thing, lying in this case. Then once they've confirmed that, now you move to the next thing, which is, okay, well, if you do lie again or you do uh, you know, hit your brother again or hit your sister again, I feel there needs to be some consequences to this because you have all the wisdom you need to know that this is unwise. And then when they select that for themselves, they're more... Uh, readily willing to fulfill that consequence and you'll find that you won't be struggling with them to not watch TV or other things like this. So ensure that you're discussing and you're having conversations, you're imparting wisdom, confirm that they understand and that they can explain back to you, you know, why is it unwise to lie? And then have them select consequences where possible for certain things that they understand that they uh, need to improve and that by removing the TV or by removing the video game, it's allowing them more time to think about what it is that they're needing to improve. And then when this thing comes back, whether it's the TV or the video games or a favorite toy, again, it's not just like, all right, the TV's back, here you go. It's okay, let's sit down and talk again. Uh, you know, it's been three days, you haven't been watching TV, what have you been thinking during that time? You know, and they're like, well, I, you know, I've realized that my lying is not helpful. You know, I need to improve this or whatever they're saying. And you walk them through some more discussion around lying. Still, they might lie again after that. But with your patience and continued persistence with these things in a nice, calm, respectful way, realizing that your role is to guide them, then ultimately you can get to a point where they improve their decision making. But it's going to take a lot of repeated guidance and a lot of patience on your part. Where you see them doing things that are wholesome and you see them making wise decisions, reward that conduct. Emphasize and highlight the positive over the negative. By you emphasizing the positive, they're going to have more of a likelihood to do these things repeatedly. And sometimes that reward uh, can be as simple as getting them a certain snack or a certain ice cream, or it can be, you know, a hug or a kiss or a high five or things like this. There's even times where I would have already, you know, bought 
my son different things. Like you're already going to buy your child some chocolate bar, some you know potato chips, some snacks and things like this. Those are things that you're already going to do as part of their life anyway. But you might as well get some extra benefit out of these things. So there were times where Bailan might have been working on right speech with his mom. And I might be sitting somewhere and I observe that he talks with his mom really politely. And I'll, after he's done, I'll call him over. I'll say, Bailan, come here. I would like to talk to you. I was just observing how you talked with your mom. Really lovely right there. That was amazing. I'm really pleased to see that. And you know what? I'm so pleased to see what you just did with your mom and how polite you were to talk with her. Why don't we go get some potato chips at 7-Eleven? He's like, really? Go get some potato chips for the way I was just talking to mom? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Would you like some potato chips? Right? So if this is something that I know that he likes, which is potato chips, I was already going to be buying him these things over the course of his life anyway. Might as well connect it to some kind of good moral conduct or some aspect of the path that he's working on <clears throat> and this is going to incentivize him to then do those things more in the future it doesn't mean i buy him that potato chips one time and now he's going to be speaking with right speech perfectly from that point forward but when you do enough of these things throughout the days and throughout the weeks they get used to getting this reward for their good conduct and you're not interested in doing it every single time but occasionally, uh, this can be really helpful to emphasize and highlight the things that they're doing well. As you're learning things from your child and they're having certain struggles in their life, don't assume that you know the full story. Sometimes if a child comes home and they've had a certain struggle with a child or with their teacher, uh, a parent might be thinking that everything their child is telling them is the 100% truth, and you might react to that and go off and make a whole bunch of unwise decisions because you're not getting the full truth. So it's important that whenever you're learning things from your children, that you don't assume that you know the full story and you talk to other people involved, whether it's the teacher, whether it's other children, whether it's their brothers and sisters or other people involved, just look at what your child's telling you as one part of the story, and then be sure that you gather information from all the other people that are involved in the situation. The location of where your child is sitting and where you're sitting, the positioning is very important as you're teaching your child. Oftentimes, we might sit at a table and be eye to eye, or you might be on a sofa or something like this. This is fine for kind of like informal discussions and, you know, little tiny things here and there. But where you have something really significant that you would like to talk with your child about, it's really helpful for the child to be sitting on the floor and you to be sitting on a chair or on a sofa or something like that, where you're above your child. Not that you're talking down to them. You're never interested in talking down to them. You would still like to be polite, kind, friendly, and respectful. But when a child is sitting on the floor and an adult is sitting in a chair or on a sofa and you're talking to them, the mind changes. It changes the mind in terms of the body positioning. They tend to be more open-minded and they tend to take things in better when they're sitting lower than the parent. And when you get used to this and you're guiding your child when there's something serious to talk about, have them come sit on the floor, they get used to this so that now if there's something serious to talk about, they might come and sit, uh, come to sit with you and you ask them to come talk to you and they might sit next to you on the sofa and you might say, you know, Bailan, I need you to sit on the floor for this one. This is something really important that dad needs to talk to you about. And then more and more, they start getting used to this and they may even choose to sit on the floor in certain situations because they know it's an important talk. So pay attention to the location and position of where you're sitting while you're guiding your child. When it's really impactful, really important things that need to be discussed, they should be lower than you. But when it's just little tiny things here and there, you know, if you are sitting on the sofa together at the dining room table or in a car or something like that, that's fine. But be sure that you're willing to be patient and waiting for that moment. If you have something really important to talk about, don't feel like you need to talk about it right now. If you're in a car, for example, driving somewhere, and you know that you've just observed something that's really important for you to talk about, if 
you need to wait until you get home so that they can sit on the floor and you can sit on the sofa, then do that because you'll see that that's going to be more impactful and it's really going to help them to open their mind and take in the content that it is that you have to share with them. Remember and understand and be sure that you thoroughly practice this, that you can be friendly with your child, but you're not their friend. Oftentimes in our time uh, these days in modern times, we're oftentimes led to believe that we should be our child's friend. The role of a friend and the role of a parent is very different. You can be friendly with your child, but you won't uh, be successful at being a friend because with your children having friends, they can blow off their friends, right? If their friend says something and they disagree, they can just blow it off. Well, if you're trying to be their friend all the time and you're trying to please them and uh, they would like to blow you off, they're gonna treat you the same way that they treat their friends. But if you understand your role as a parent, that you can be friendly, but you're not their friend, then it takes on a new meaning in this relationship and you can be more supportive and encouraging and impart wisdom with your child. Because oftentimes friends aren't necessarily doing that. Friends aren't necessarily always supportive. Friends aren't necessarily always encouraging. Friends aren't necessarily imparting wisdom to help an individual become a better, wiser decision maker. But that's what a parent's doing in the role as a parent. So if you've been taught or you've been influenced to be your child's friend, I would suggest that this isn't going to necessarily work out for you because the way that a child is going to interact with their friends needs to be very different than the way that they interact with their parent. And if you're looking to guide this individual to be a wise decision making decision maker, maintaining your role and establishing this role as a parent is going to be much more successful for you because you're this primary gardener who's gardening and looking to grow this plant. And a friend isn't necessarily doing that. They're interacting in a very different way. Um, ensure your child understands what true love is, and that's something that you're gonna to need to teach them, but you're also gonna to need to uh, practice that with them through your actions. We can tell a child multiple times, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. But the way that they're gonna understand love and the way that they're gonna feel your love and experience your love, is through your actions. So it's helpful for you to understand how to practice true love, love without attachment, and to practice that more and more readily and realize that your actions are gonna speak much more than your words. Of course, you know, you use your words to let your children know that you love them, but you're gonna be communicating a whole lot more through your actions than you are uh, through your words. So you can communicate love through your actions and being sure that they understand what love is because they might not be reading your love uh, uh, in the best way because if they're not getting what they want, they might think that that means you don't love them because they have a certain craving for, uh, say, a chocolate bar and they don't necessarily get it then they might feel like because they're experiencing painful feelings because of not getting the chocolate bar, you don't love them. But you can point out to them that that's not actually love. Just because you're not getting what you want doesn't mean that I don't love you. In fact, sometimes not giving a child what they want is the most loving and kind thing that you can do for them to teach them to eliminate their craving, desire, attachments. If you have multiple children in the family, it's important that you treat them all equally. Sometimes as parents, we might treat one child one way and another child another way, but you need to love and treat all the children equally. And this is going to ensure that there's fairness among the family and that you treat all beings in the family equally. Whereas if there's difference in the way that you um, treat individuals, then it's not going to be helpful in guiding them to grow and to cultivate the wisdom that you need. And they're going to be resentful of you not treating everybody equally. So if you treat one child one way and this child gets all the goodness and all the great things and this other child doesn't get those things, it's going to produce resentment from one child to the parents. Be sure to prioritize quality time versus quantity of time. 
Sometimes we think that the quantity of time is most important, but in reality, it's the quality of time. If you're only spending one hour with your child, if it's a really good quality time and you're not on your phone, you're not taking phone calls, you're not surfing a social media and things like this, but you're spending good quality time with your child, that's going to be more impactful than if you spend 20 hours with your child, but you're on your phone searching social media and doing all kinds of other random tasks. So be sure you're looking at the quality of time that you're spending with your child, not necessarily the quantity. And then lastly, uh, if there's shared custody and you have an ex-spouse and your children are going with your ex-spouse and you're guiding them through the path to enlightenment and the Eightfold Path and your ex-spouse isn't, understand that when they come back home that you're going to need to be patient because when they go away to their mother or their dad's house who's not practicing the teachings, they're not being guided in the same way. Whether that's for a day or a weekend or a couple of weeks over the summer or what have you, when they come back to you, they're not going to be practicing in the same way as they were with you. Because as they went away to the other parent's house, they weren't being guided in the same way. So there's going to be this adjustment period that you're going to need to get used to. Whereas if they were with you for an extended period of time, they were practicing these teachings really well, and now they went away and they come back, and you're expecting and craving for them to be practicing the teachings exactly the same way they were when they were with you previously, this is your own craving, your own desire, your own attachment. So understand that you're going to need to have this patience for this adjustment period as they come back. Still guide them, still help them see that they're not practicing the teachings, but you're going to need to be patient with that as you guide them to come back up to practicing the teachings where they were when they were with you prior to going to their mother or their dad's house that is now perhaps an ex-spouse. And on this same topic, your children's mind can be easily influenced by friends at school or teachers or other people around them. So as you send your kids off to school or daycare or if they're going to summer camps or things like this, it's going to be the same thing is that they might be practicing these teachings to a certain degree. But then when they go to school and they're around their friends or they go away to daycare or they're around certain teachers or they go away to summer camp, when they come back home, they're not going to be practicing the teachings necessarily as well as they were previous to that. That doesn't mean that you you know, don't guide them or that you don't provide them the wisdom that they need to improve. It just means that you need to understand that that's part of the process that uh, as you guide them, they're going to be influenced by others. They're going to take a couple of steps back, but then you help them take some more steps forward. And then they take a couple of steps back and then you take a couple of steps forward. And this is all part of the process. It's also helpful to understand pleasant feelings, painful feelings, neither painful nor pleasant. And your goal isn't to get your child really excited about all kinds of things that are going on in their life. Sometimes this is what we're taught, that when mom or dad comes home, this is time to get so excited. Or if you're opening gifts, this is a time to get so excited about everything. Well, if you're incentivizing the excitement, then it's only a matter of time before they get sad or bored or lonely or something else. So what I would encourage you to do is understand the difference between non-excitement versus enjoyment. So it's possible to enjoy things without having this high degree of excitement. There doesn't need to be this thrill, this euphoria, this extreme excitement in situations. You can enjoy the moment and enjoy what you're doing and then help your child know that, okay, it's time to move on and go to the next thing. Whereas if you're incentivizing this extreme excitement in certain activities that they're doing, then it's only a matter of time before their mind experiences loneliness or boredom or sadness or frustration. Because if you're causing their mind to learn how to base their inner feelings of excitement on some condition. We're opening gifts. So this is a time to get excited. Well, then when we're not opening gifts, we're going to be sad. 
or mom and dad is home. This is a condition. Time to get excited. Let's get so excited. Well, then when mom and dad are gone, they're going to miss you. They're going to be lonely. They're going to be bored. So you're not interested in incentivizing their mind to create inner feelings based on some condition. So learn how to enjoy things in the moment. And it's okay for you and your children to enjoy things. But then when you're done with that, you move on to the next thing. You're not basing your inner feelings on the condition of what it is that you're actually doing in that certain moment. And then lastly, the unenlightened mind functions very much through a praise and reward. If you're understanding this about how animals function, the unenlightened mind functions very much like an animal. That if an animal was needing to be taught to go out to the outside to go to the bathroom or it needs to be taught to sit or shake hands or these other things that we might teach our animals. When they do a certain behavior, we give them a treat or we rub them on their head or we pet them. And this incentivizes them to continue to do that same behavior because it's something that you would like the animal to continue to do. Well, the unrelated mind function, functions exactly the same way through this praise and reward. So where you see that your child is doing things that are positive, when they're doing certain things that are wholesome, you can also reward their efforts, not necessarily their results, but re even reward their efforts. Even if you see them struggling with right speech, they didn't quite get to right speech but they're actually working and they're really trying. So what you're doing is you're rewarding the efforts, not necessarily always rewarding the results. And remember that your reward can be your positive words, like, hey, you did that really well. You know, I really admire that. I really appreciate how you're doing that. That's really wonderful. You can reward them with hugs and kisses and other things like this, and even snacks and things that I mentioned before. So a child's mind is going to tend to do things that they're being incentivized to do. So you can reward them with words, hugs, kisses, uh, things like that, high fives. Um, but you're not interested in doing this every single moment that they're doing something wonderful because then they get used to only doing this wholesome conduct or making these wise decisions if they get the reward. So you would like to kind of sprinkle these things in here and there. And sometimes, you know, don't do it. That when you see them practicing right speech, for example, you don't reward it. But early on, to get them moving in the right direction, you might incentivize and reward things more readily. And then as you start seeing them practice, you start expanding that and, and putting more and more distance between your rewards so that they're now doing this moral conduct and making this wise decisions without the reward, just because it's the wise thing to do. So this is everything that I had to share with you guys. I'll see what questions you guys have. You can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Yes, Teacher David, thank you. Tonka has her hand raised. We have two questions from Brandon on YouTube. First question is, if a child asks to help them meditate, what is a good time limit to start? My children have sporadically asked in the past and I've normally done five minutes. Yeah, I wouldn't set any kind of alarm or any kind of predetermined time. I would just let them meditate for whatever amount of time that they would like to meditate and whenever they're done they're done if they do three minutes that's fine if they do 10 minutes that's fine just let them do whatever they do and then whatever they do then encourage them to do more next time right so if you're kind of watching the time and they do five minutes the first time you know reward that be like wow that's wonderful you you did an absolutely amazing you know job here whatever it is that you would like to say to them and then when they get ready to do meditation the next time you, you can say you know last time you guys did five minutes would you like to try to do a little bit more this time and they're like yeah let's try to do some more okay you know dad will keep track of the time you guys do as long as you feel like you would like to do and, and dad will let you know you know how much time you did but see if you can do more than five minutes this time you know and you can do that every once in a while you know you're not interested in in doing that every single time they meditate but every third time every fourth time maybe encourage and incentivize them to expand their meditation a little bit thank you 
And second question is regarding the role being a parent versus a friend. Does this evolve as they get closer to adulthood? You should always maintain the role as a parent. You know, we're friendly to our children. We can be polite, kind, friendly, respectful. We should always be that way with them. But always remember your role as a parent because a friend is going to function very differently in a relationship uh, than a, what a parent needs to function. So I don't suggest that you ever consider yourself a friend of your child, but instead always maintain that role as a parent because what you're looking to do is provide guidance and realizing that you're impermanent in this child's life in that uh, you would like to maintain this role of imparting wisdom and providing guidance. And uh, friends don't necessarily do that. Friends are going to function very differently in relationships. And friends come and go, right? And parents don't necessarily do that. So you, by maintaining your role as a parent, you'll find that you'll have a much more stable, more solid uh, interaction with your child and they will be able to distinguish the difference between how they interact with mom and dad versus how they interact with their uh, friends. Thank you, sir. Chris Reyes has a question. Hi, teacher David. I have a question, but it's a little off topic and it's more about um, the, the general practice. Is this a proper time to ask um, questions about general practicing or should that be asked another time? I think what we can do is we can see all of the different questions we have on this topic. And then because uh, we're uh, over two hours in our class, maybe you can post your question in the Facebook group or you can send it privately if you like, or we can discuss it through personal guidance, Chris. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you, teacher David, I really appreciate it. Appreciate your teaching today. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And it appears that is all the questions that we have for today, sir. All right. Well, this area of guiding children along the path, it can be very rewarding. Uh, it can be uh, very impactful, very beneficial. When I have been guiding Bailan over the last four years, multiple times it comes to my mind if I would have just had this when I was a kid, boy, would I have been have saved myself a whole lot of grief and misery growing up because my childhood was very turbulent and very difficult. I didn't have anybody to guide me along the path the way that Bailan has uh, in this life. And uh, here I see in Thailand children being guided by, by their parents as well. And, you know, the, the children have the utmost respect and gratitude and appreciation uh, for their parents. And these are the kind of things that we can experience when we guide our children patiently with politeness, kindness, friendliness, and respect. And then not only are you bringing these teachings to your child, but also keep in mind that as your child is learning these teachings and they're gaining an understanding of the truth, it's not like they're going to walk away from that truth. Once they gain this wisdom, not only are you helping your children, but you're helping your grandchildren, your great grandchildren and so forth and so on for many generations to come by you sharing these teachings with your child. Not only are they going to experience having more wisdom and be able to make wiser decisions and have less and less struggles in the world, but you're also helping your grandchildren, your great grandchildren, many generations to come. So this is one of the most wonderful things you could ever do is bring these teachings into the world to help yourself, to help those close to you and helping your family and having them spread throughout your different relationships within your family. And this is ultimately helping all of humanity as more and more of us are functioning in a way that's harmless and we're interacting in more and more of an enlightened and an awakened way. So keep that in mind as you're sharing these teachings with your child, that it's not just your child that you're sharing these teachings with, it's many generations. Because once your children learn these teachings, they're gonna end up then sharing the same wisdom with their children as well. So thank you all for your questions. Thank you all for uh, participating in the class. It was really wonderful to be able to share these types of teachings with you. 
In our next class, we're going to be discussing how to eliminate attachment to those who are closest to us, because this is one of the most challenging uh, attachments to eliminate. Oftentimes, as somebody's getting closer and closer to enlightenment, the th attachments that are around the longest are the ones that are the most deeply rooted. And from what I observe, oftentimes relationships are some of the most challenging attachments for people to let go of. You know, if you're needing to let go of substances that cause heedlessness, that takes a, a certain amount of work, but you can ultimately do that. You know, if you need to let go of the attachment to your mobile phone, you know, you can do that. If you need to let go of the attachment to a, a favorite pair of shoes or a favorite purse or something like this, you, you can do that pretty readily. And it's something that you can maybe do uh, without too much uh, struggle. But when it comes to relationships and the people that we spend the most time with, this is one of the most challenging uh, attachments to let go of, whether it's your children, your life partner, your parents, your siblings, uh, other people that are really close to you. So in our next class, I'm going to be sharing with you how you can maintain your relationships but eliminate the attachment. And when you eliminate attachment in your relationships, this is where your relationships can be completely harmonious. You can have nothing but peacefulness and joy in your relationships. As long as your mind is attached to others or other people are attached to you, there's going to be discontentedness in your relationship. And this is oftentimes where we sabotage our relationships and then they end, they end because of our cravings, desires, attachments. So our next class is going to be focused on that as part of our retreat series, Harmony and Relationships. And then this Wednesday, we're going to be doing loving kindness meditation together. So you're welcome to join for that. So I'll see you guys in a future class. Have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. Sawadee Thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much.